We are live. Yeah. Apparently. How do you tell, Mike? I don't know. It says live at the top of my screen. I see live at the top of my screen, too. So um, things are looking good so far. Yeah. I'm John. And that's Mike. I'm Mike. And we're Musky Factory Baits. And if you're signing in, which I hope we'll see in a moment that there's some people, um, we're really happy to have you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm broadcasting live from Menlo Park Musky World, which is my basement in, uh, in Orleans. Um, and Mike is broadcasting from the Musky Factory, Musky Factory Bates World Technology Headquarters at his basement. You can see he's the MacGyver on the team. He can fix anything. Thing. he can build anything he's always been that guy and he's good at finding the breaking point of anything <laughs> good at that too i can see some uh, names coming up welcome dave anthony is here luke welcome luke all right hey anthony from sapatizer baits and one of our guides good to see you anthony luke dave all right Okay, well, do you think we should start? Yeah, it's time. It's time. If we don't All start right. now, we're going to run home at the end. This is our first time um, doing a Monday night musky seminar on a Tuesday night, so um, it's wonderful to see you all. Um, I always start out any presentations I do by saying thank you, and so the first one, uh, the first thank you this evening is uh, a thank you to you. Um, for attending. This is uh, an event for the public um, and for us because it's going to be a whole bunch of fun and hopefully a bunch of learning for everybody. Um, it's driven by you, so your questions, your feedback, your suggestions for topics um, will help us plan each of the events that we're going to have in the next 20 weeks. Um, of Muskie Monday seminars. So thank you for starters. I always say thank you to Shimano. They're, uh, they've been a big part of my fishing world for uh, a bunch of years. I love their products. I love what they do for, for fishing. Um, can't say enough good things about them. I want to say thank you to Andre Lalone Marine out in Wendover. Andre is hands down the best boat guy I have ever been with. This was break everything on your boat year. And, uh, Andre rescued me over and over and over from some unbelievable calamities. So thanks, Andre. Um, thanks to Suic Lures. Um, Suic, uh, I'm really proud to be on the Suic Pro Team here in Canada. Um, and Mike Suic's actually going to be a guest of ours later on. And Muskie Factory Baits is uh, becoming an official distributor of Suic Lures um, early in the new year. So we'll talk about... Uh, franken suics and things like that as we go along i want to say thank you to muskies canada um just a huge part of both mike's and my uh musky lives and and our learning curves over a lot of years um, mike introduced me to to muskies canada maybe 25 years ago Easy. somewhere right in there and uh, look both more than that eh yeah i thought so never mind um both of us are still here 25 later 25 years later can't say enough good things about that organization um, as a place to learn um, as a place to participate in science as a place to impact the fishery so we'll talk about muskies canada from time to time and uh with musky factory baits um we put two dollars from every bait we sell into research that we drive through muskies canada we leverage that muskie uh, that money with muskies canada other groups and other chapters and we end up supporting some really good research so um, it's all synergistic and it all goes back to muskies uh, what is the monday night muskie seminar series and why is it starting on a tuesday um, well it's starting on a tuesday because france my wife had her birthday on Monday, yesterday, and as an experienced muskie fisherman, the first good piece of advice I could pass on to you young muskie bucks is um, your partner puts up with you 
and your crazy addiction and time away from home. So the least you can do is uh, be really good to them when it counts. And France is really wonderful and really good to me. Thanks, France. And so we're here Tuesday tonight, but we're going to be here for the next 19 Mondays after this up until musky season with a different topic and a different guest um, every week. Um, we have an amazing lineup. What we hope to do is present for 60 to 90 minutes. Um, it's going to be a sharing of information and knowledge from very experienced and successful people in the muskie world. Uh, we're going to do this through some short seminars, demonstrations, um, interviews. We're going to tell stories, but mostly it's driven by your comments, your discussion, and your questions. Um, if we don't get to your questions um, during the event itself, I promise that we'll write back to you with an answer um, fairly soon after that. Um, Lisa Goodyear is uh, a big part of uh, the Ottawa River Muskie Factory, and she's helping us behind the scenes tonight. She's going to answer a lot of the questions that come in because um, I'm not not nearly intelligent enough to read a screen, answer questions, and talk at the same time. Um, so thanks to Lisa, and uh, we'll um, air some of your questions every couple of minutes, um, the ones that are poignant and, uh, and good, and we'll... Uh, We'll discuss those here, so please send them in. Um, different guests, I'll tell you what we have coming up. <clears throat> Pete Bowman from Fish in Canada. We're gonna talk about 35 years of filming muskies everywhere in this country and in Fish in Canada. And Pete's a big supporter of the, the muskie industry. He's been out to New Brunswick the last couple of years. They've been all over and, and they've caught stupid, stu for bass guys, for bass guys, they've caught mostly bass guys, they've caught stupid big muskies, bigger than most of us. And they have um, the greatest day of uh, musky fishing ever filmed um, on one of their shows. So we'll touch on that. JP DeRose, the most technically knowledgeable guy I have ever met in the fishing world. Um, JP runs the Renegade uh, Bass Circuit TV events. Um, he's filmed and, and coordinated uh, so many TV shows, does so much uh, seminar and presentation work. So happy to be with him. Big Jim McLaughlin. Everybody jo knows Big Jim McLaughlin. Going to be so happy to have him here. Um, Jim and I are going to talk about the history of fishing and the old days of muskie fishing. That's going to be a can't miss because in the fishing world, Jim's the only guy I know um, who survived both the First and Second World Wars. So his muskie stories they go way, way, way back. And uh, I know I'm, that's the first singer of the night in case anyone's keeping score. And uh, I know Jim's going to make me pay for that later. Lawrence Gunther from Bluefish is going to join us. We're going to do a show on research, um, all the latest research, including what's going on on the St. Lawrence with Young of the Year Muskies. There's some, some good news and some better stories I hear this year. Um, Lawrence, a big promoter of sustainable fishing uh, through Bluefish. Um, and a good friend. We're going to have a great show with him. Rob Jackson, RJ, and Wally Robbins, and Jamie Pastilli. Uh, we're going to get these three incredible local legends together, talk about the Rideau River and the other fisheries in eastern Ontario and western Quebec. Um, you know, we're famous for the Ottawa, but it's actually uh, easier to catch a muskie on the Rideau than anywhere else, and there's a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of secret jewels out there that that we'll try and expose people to a few of. Um, Frank Ungaro, this will be a really interesting one. Frank's from the Ugly Pike podcast series. Now, I met Frank before he started this series, and we talked to, you know, uh, we talked about where he wanted to go with this, and his learning curve in the musky world is uh, off the charts. Frank has interviewed um, the who's who of the musky world for from Gord Pizer to Jim Sarek to all the famous American guides, to all the lure makers to the scientists, and and, and in not just in 60 to one to two hour in-depth interviews. There's learning in those that you you can't get anywhere else. We're going to talk to Frank about his learning curve, um, about the jewels that he's extracted from uh, the Ugly Pike series, and uh, and some of Frank and uh, Frank and I have had some pretty fun and pretty amazing fishing adventures uh, 
um, and we'll talk a little bit about those. We had one just a few weeks back in December, uh, just phenomenal way to end the end the season. So that one's coming up in a couple of weeks, and next week, Brent Bochak. Uh, Brent Bochak's the host of Setting the Hook, the new TV show out of Southern Ontario. Um, and you know Brent as a present, uh, a show host, a presenter, a seminar speaker. He gave the Muskie One uh, 101 introductory uh, introduction to muskie fishing seminar at the last musky odyssey he's going to revisit that with us next week um we're going to start with musky basics um from equipment to techniques to what you need to get going to the to what catches the most fish right off the bat um to how to not to waste your time to how to and to how to learn so that's next week on monday on the uh, uh on the monday night musky seminar series watch for all of our guests um, our topics coming up on the Muskie Factory Baits um, page. And please like the Muskie Factory Baits page. And in fact, um, to encourage you to do that, um, we're having a contest where we're going to give away a hybrid to um, some lucky listener or viewer who tells us that they liked um, the Muskie Factory Baits page and that they liked this video when it gets posted um, on the page permanently at the end of this evening. Lisa's going to go on with more specific instructions on that. And just a reminder, that contest is going to run for two weeks, and we're going to pull that name live on the air two weeks from now um, with Frank here. So that's what the Monday Night Musky series is. That's a lot of talking in a row, and I'm going to have some of my giant purple energy drink. Excuse me for a moment. I always found that an energy drink helped me before a presentation or a seminar. It does give you wings. I think it does help you and give you mental wings. I don't know. We'll see. Or maybe you just get really chatty at the end. Who knows? The introduction and outline on where we're going to go today. Um, day one, um, Mike Spratt, my great friend, and I are going to talk to you about um, the blade bait world, um, the hamburgers of the musky world. Um, the baits that catch um, more muskies than any other bait, um, that catch more 50-inch fish than all other baits combined, the most popular bait in the world. And I, we call them the hamburgers of the muskie world because everybody makes blade baits. Um, they've been around for a long time, um, but they have evolved to a whole new, new level in the last 20 years. So we're going to go in-depth and in-detail on musky baits, uh, musky blade baits and their parts, inlines, spinner baits, hybrids, um, the components and the construction um, thereof. Mike's going to take you through um, all the details of the bait and the guts of the bait, and we'll talk about what makes a bait good and what makes a bait less good, and what you want to know as a consumer of these baits. Um, we're going to talk about strengths and weaknesses of uh, of blade baits in general. Um, repair, use, and maintenance tips. Uh, we're going to talk about how to make fishing with inlines easier because as a guide, I can tell you people stop throwing inlines, uh, especially young guys, it seems, because it's a lot of work to throw a blade bait all, die, all day. It's by far the most productive bait, but it is a lot of work. And there's a whole bunch of things you can do to make it easier to use. So um, we'll talk about that. And uh, let's see, we'll talk about blade baits. Um, one of the reasons for their success is they're the highest hooking percentage of any bait. They're wire and hooks. And that's something that's really important in, in the uh, in the musky world. Um, it really important as, as a guide um, and important to everybody who fishes because every day as a guide, we get fish that put teeth on baits that we don't catch. And so that hooking percentage, anything you can do to up that of the utmost importance. Um, and I wanted to give an ode to uh, to the creator of the modern day um, inline, and I don't have one here, amazingly enough, is the cowgirl. So um, everybody, they're, they're the hamburgers of the, the musky world, but 
Um, everybody makes a hamburger owes uh, a tip of the hat to Muskie yeah. Mayhem and Cowgirls. And that bait was created 20 years ago. And we call them blade baits now. But if, if we were doing this seminar 20 years ago, nobody would say blade baits. You'd call them bucktails. And they would be single spinners only. And the back of the bait would most likely be bucktail, the tail of a deer. Um, and bucktails ruled the inline world for since their inception, um, probably 60 or 70 years ago. So that change that Muskie Mayhem made by taking two blades intertwined with clevises like this, that change and adding flash on the back of the bait changed everything in the musky world from that point on. And in the last 20 years, I said it a moment ago, but it's worth repeating. This bait has caught more muskies over 50 inches than all other baits in the history of musky fishing combined. So that's why we're talking about blade baits and inlines this evening, because um, you should be using them. Mike? Why don't you take over? Yeah, and give us uh, give us the ins and outs of constructing baits and take sure it away. Can thanks, John. Um, so I have to start. Anyone who's uh, ever visited John at his at his lodge in Treadwell and seen the number of baits that make up the walls and curtains, um, they certainly understand uh, that uh, John has an appreciation for musky lures like probably nobody else in the industry. Um, so it, four years ago when uh, he and I started talking about making baits, um, a lot of it is a no-brainer because John was able to make uh, so many of the great decisions that we did um, from day one. Uh, I'm going to show you a bunch of them uh, that just make a fa fabulous bait. Um, the other great advantage that I have with John as a partner is, of course, nobody else is able to beat up a bait like John does. Uh, his boat is on the water 180 days a year or so, and he's got people fishing, and they are pounding these blades all the time. Um, so when it comes time to test for durability and longevity and that sort of a thing, John's the guy. I can give it to him, and he can beat up a, a lure in a month more than most people can in a lifetime. So um, what I thought I would do is uh, I'm going to go through uh, a couple of our staples just to uh, show you guys some of, our, some of the big de decisions that we made. Um, and some of the ways that our lures come out and, and why they're so effective. Um, I've got one here. Uh, the blue and white is uh, it, it's a great lure because it's, it's changed names a couple of times. It started as the Mike Babcock, and then Mike Babcock got fired. It became the, the lure formerly known as Mike Babcock, and we're settling in on a new one now. Um, from the top of the bait, I'm going to hold it up. You're going to notice... Musky factory baits, they all come with a perfect loop. Um, and that was from day one. Uh, before we had anything, uh, we invested in the machinery that allows us to make that perfect loop with a triple twist um, and a smooth, smooth cutoff for uh, every single, single lure. And um, having that perfect loop every time, obviously, number one is it makes them look professional. It makes them look like they are handmade with care. Um, but they also are smooth, and if they get wrapped around your line or leader, they're not going to cut it the way that a sharp edge would. Um, you're going to notice on our baits, and it's often a point of discussion, um, what kind of wire goes in the lure. Um, and on our standard baits, uh, we use, they call it the 51, um, which is 51 thousandths of an inch, um, or 0 0.051 inches. Um, and that it's not the thickest wire. It's in fact uh, the second thickest that you can tie one with. Um, I do put tie baits with the thicker version, which is uh, 62 thousandths of an inch. Um, but what it boils down to is the thinner a wire you can get away with, the more vibration you have in the bait. And in, a, in an inline bait, it's vibration that the fish are sensing, right? These baits are dynamite in the Ottawa River because often visibility is low. And those fish are hunting with their lateral lines. And between the thump of the blades and the vibration of the wire, um, those fish are honing in on the bait long before they have a visual on it. 
um, which is a big part of its success. So we generally stick with the thinner wire. As John said, he's gonna talk a little later about uh, straightening that wire because they do get bent. They will get bent by your first fish. Uh, you, they'll get bent by your first muskie and they can get bent by your first pike, unfortunately. Um, it happens. Um, and there's definitely trips uh, and uh, tricks to straightening that out and making sure that your lure can continue to swim. Um, so, like I said, generally it's the thinner wire that we use. We have a heavy duty version of our lures called the HD that comes with the 62. Um, and of course, whenever I'm making custom, um, people often ask for that heavier gauge of wire of 62. And again, it's, it's tied with care. It's a different tool. I have to cut it off with a Dremel and smooth it down. So there's a little more time involved to making sure that we get that high quality finish at the top of our bait. Um, John already pointed out the double clevises that have to overlap. So the idea is that one gauge will engage, uh, one blade will engage the other blade as soon as they start to spin. And they start to spin because we have a very standard gap at the top of our baits. Um, you'll notice that every one has uh, at least an inch of exposed wire between the top bead and the loop. And that extra wire is what allows those blades to engage, start spinning almost immediately on every cast. And as you know, having that immediate engagement of the blades is often what triggers those quick strikes shortly after the lure hits the water. Um, and it was, uh, it was never a decision to shorten that up to save on wire or materials. It's always about catching more fish, which is more important. Um, when I uh, open up under the blades, this one here we call a double-double. I'm going to hold that up to the camera. So all of our beads on the inlines are solid brass beads, nickel-plated. Um, they're heavier, they're tougher, um, they're very much more expensive than hollow ones, um, but they, they last. They do what they're supposed to do. They keep the, the bait vibrating. They keep it low in the water when you troll because there's weight involved. Um, and they withstand the teeth of muskies. Um, it's a really important part of that bait um, to be able to withstand the teeth. Moving down to the skirts. Um, our skirts are tied with care. Um, every single one, there's a lot of time involved in making uh, the perfect skirt. Um, our flash is all salt water. Um, it is something that uh, sets us apart uh, from a lot of others. Um, having that 1 16th width on the flash. Um, we do custom blends. I blend it all in house. Um, so I'm the one that uh, decides on the color. John and I decide on colors and, and we make it happen. Uh, we best invest an awful lot of money in having a selection um, of colors that are used to make up our, our, our different skirts, the blends and the skirts. And it also, it gives us the luxury or the privilege of being able to put together almost any custom that a customer is looking for. Um, and I know, I, I see names in the crowd that I know I've made custom for you guys. Um, and you know, all you have to do is send me an email um, and generally I can make it happen. I can do that with the skirts. I'll talk about uh, coating the blades in a minute, um, but I can do that for anybody. And uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our line has started as a custom. Somebody has asked for a custom bait um, and there's a few out there whereas people have requested a custom i make the bait i look at the bait and realize it's beautiful you got to look at this and then we talk about making it into uh something that is um a, a real line for us and they they are fish catchers that's for sure um under the skirt at the very bottom our hook is that there's there's obviously a piece of lead there our hook uh is ink wrapped um and we're talking this year we're going to be offering drink wrap and some extra hooks for sale. Um, this can get, if you have to cut a hook um, in your hook removal process, our shrink wrap is, it's a very uh, high caliber shrink wrap. It, it has a glue inside um, that really keeps that hook in line, which is super important for your hooking percentage. Um, and of course, if you have to change a hook in a pinch, um, deals like electrical tape um, or off the shelf, uh, shrink wrap will do just fine to put that hook back to put a replacement hook back in place um, But if you want the real thing, we're gonna have that available this year it's a, it's a great idea, and I know that lots of people appreciate that our hooks are all flat proof 
Um, there is uh, every little bit has um, a personal touch to it or a craftsmanship touch to it. Or Johnny's got the, the repair kits. Um, so all of our hooks, they have a, a dab of a, adhesive um, in between um, all three. And what that does is that prevents the flash from getting caught in there. I think uh, from a lot of us uh, who have fixed flash for a long time, particularly the, the finer flash, it can get jammed in that hook um, and to a point where it can write off the lure. It can, it can totally decrease the hooking percentage. It definitely destroys the action of the, um, of the flash in the water or the hair in the water. Um, and uh, ultimately it's the end of the lure um, event or eventually. So that, that little touch, we do that on all of our hooks, including the replacement hooks. It goes a, a very long way in keeping these these lures in as good a shape as they can be, of course, until the fish get a hold of them. Um, I'm gonna show you, I chose this lure because it's got a couple of fancy touches on the blades. Our blades were uh, one of those choices we made from the beginning. Um, for those of you guys who own our, our baits, um, they're almost exclusively hex blades. Hex blades are easier to pull through the water, so they provide the same thump. They have the same surface area going round and round. Um, but that hex fat, uh, pattern cuts the surface tension a little bit um, and it makes them easier to reel in. So of course on a long day, um, that's gonna add to your day and add to your evening probably um, to make that work. It was a decision we made a long time ago and we've stuck with it and it has produced very well. We do have blades um, and some people are very fond of having one smooth blade um, the Gordy has one smooth nickel blade, and then uh, some of our, our uh, gold baits have one smooth gold blade and one hex, um, which again is a different thump. Having variety in the water is good for triggering those seasoned fish. Um, so the hex pattern is super important. Um, we've always gone with the, when we talk about the shape of the blade, these are Magnum Indianas. Um, Magnum Indianas, um, they stay higher in the water. They have a higher uh, vertical. They, they tend to keep the bait up top, which is where fish tend to hit it, right? And then um, we offer them in different sizes. So the, the stronger you feel, um, the bigger blades there are. We even do some specialty ones with uh, mag-12s, um, which for regular human beings is a trolling bait, uh, but I definitely have sold them to uh, hardcore who like to cast them, yeah. Um, and then I'm going to hold up this uh, this blade here. This is one um, this is one blade that's uh, from what we call the the white goblin, I think. Um, and this is a a pearlescent white um, with black stripes on it. So all of our baits are powder coated. All of our blades are powder coated. It's also done in house. I do it myself in the garage, um, and no corners are cut. Um, we use uh, the electrostatic powder coating system um, like a professional would. It ensures uh, a proper coat and a proper thickness of the powder before it gets baked, um, which makes sure that they are, it's well adhesed to the, um, to the nickel blade that's underneath. Um, paint just doesn't stick. Uh, paint looks really pretty and it's easy to apply, um, but it doesn't have the lasting power of a powder coat. So there's a lot of time. This particular blade here, goes in and out of the oven five times in order to achieve what you're looking at. It has to get baked twice to create the pearl and then to achieve these perfect stripes, which really look dynamite in the water uh, because they're done front and back, totally symmetrical. They really have that look of them. So there's a lot of time when, uh, when we talk about that craftsmanship uh, that, made in, that made all Canadian, all American, North American parts um, and that in-house craft, um, there's a lot of care that goes into making these baits. And again, I can powder coat anything. Um, and I've had custom orders um, with every color under the sun if I don't have it in-house. Um, if I don't have it in-house, it, it's a phone call away. Um, and we've tried that. And of course, the weirder the color that we order, the more unique the bait is. Um, I have a couple others to share with you guys. Um, this one here is our famous color, the Johnny A. John, and John wanted to claim the purple and black because of its success. Um, this one here, I'm just holding it up so it's correct in the light. This one here, uh, we call it a sonic. It has a bell on it. I don't know how it goes through the audio, 
but these bells are they ring it's a it's a true dinner dinner bell on the bait um so you can imagine when it's on a thin wire um, and it's got the thumps of the blade um that really has a sound that's going to it so that's become very popular um the bells uh aside from the the blue fox staple um bells are uh, pretty hard uh, feature to find so that's a specialty item that we've been doing it's been really successful for sales it's been very successful on the water i know i i always keep one in my tackle box um i have a marabou here so that's a that's a shout out to our our hair tire jason wilson he does a fabulous job that's the one thing um that doesn't happen in my basement is uh, i have not taken on the uh, the challenges of marabou but what he does uh, is exceptional um john got one of our tiger kings there so that's coupled with the striped blades right um, they're very, very pretty lures. They're, they're as pretty out of the water as they are in the water. And of course, when the marabou is really laid on um, so nicely, um, it really goes well in the vortex of the blades. I know uh, Jason is always complaining that he throws out three quarters of a bag of feathers. Um, when he picks through those feathers, he doesn't want to use anything but the best. Um, and so he ends up picking through them, and oddly, he'll he'll sometimes sell them on Kijiji to other people who are happy to take his seconds. Um, and then the last model that I'm going to go through um, is the spinner bait that we make. We call it the hybrid. Um, we call it the hybrid because it is a little different um, from most spinner baits on the market, whereas the bottom half is really um, the exact same as our inlines. So we have the, you know, we have the same shrink wrap to keep that treble hook upright, we have a, a, a treble hook front, and so you really you have a higher hooking per percentage. It's not weedless like the single hook varieties that um, that uh, a lot of spin spinner baits off offer, and uh, those absolutely have their application, um, particularly uh, in the springtime when you're burning over weeds. Um, when it comes to hooking fish. Um, these ones here really have a nice finish to them, right? Um, the biggest part of the design um, that we did with these ones is we made sure we had this loop in the front, and I pulled that way up. This loop is super important. Um, not only did we have to buy a special ma machine to make that, um, but we had to modify it to make sure that we could use it on the thicker wire so that it would fit, and we'd be able to produce that perfect loop for every bait. Um, for those people that have used um, spinner baits in the past that have a, a twisted loop, I'll hold that right up so you can see it like that. That's a twisted loop there, and that that is snapped right off. My blades are gone um, from that one. I mean, it's super old, this guy, um, as you can see by the bucktail. Um, but a twisted loop, uh, a twisted loop has a limited lifetime um, because there is constantly pressure. Pushing this, uh, pushing on this bead, pushing down. The larger blade you place at the back, it is uh, interchangeable because it's on a split ring, and people do like to go big. Um, but the larger blade will put more pressure on that bend. Um, uh, sometimes it'll whack a hook, or it'll actually damage your flash if it's too much pressure. Um, but that loop in the front is what's going to make this lure sustain under pressure for a very, very long time, right? And then once again, nothing but the best handmade. So you're dealing with even the smallest blades, these tiny Colorados that we put on, I powder coat these. I have to powder coat them one at a time to make sure that they have that perfect finish um, that I'm very particular about. In this case, we have a nice blue blade. And uh, this is uh, this is the color we call Charlie's Gold. It was featured on Fishful Thinking last Saturday. Um, that's all I had to share. John, did you, did you have anything else to add about the baits? No, that was uh, that was awesome, Mike. Um, just maybe uh, I'll take it from there, and I'll, I'll talk about how the, the the what you end up with in perfect construction and with the double bladed inlines. Um, different than any other bait is uh, a vortex. Now, Mike mentioned the vortex. The two blades together 
create a vortex that a single blade doesn't. And then flashaboo as a material, um, there's nothing that reacts in a vortex. Uh, vortex is just drawing your flash. drawing your flash out into as 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 big and lifelike um a looking bait as, as you can possibly get and it takes it's funny it took the two blades together and the flash abu to create that look you can put other materials in behind it but the flash on its own um, the flash and the marabou behave quite differently in the water together um, because of that vortex, the marabou has a, a real life and a real lifelike look. This is an even bigger look in the water. So um, that vortex and that flashaboo, that's the key that makes this bait work. Um, Mike talked about the vibration. It's interesting that when these were first created, they became famous in Minnesota and mostly from the guides who fished at night. There's a, a, a lot of pressure on the Minnesota lakes and a lot of guides start their trips out at 10 o'clock at night and fish in the dark and so uh, all of the first fish that this bait got famous for were caught in the dark because for whatever reason the frequency that the double blades puts off together um, is something that muskies just can't resist and you know they see this bait over and over and over more than any other bait you know that and yet they still eat it you know they do get conditioned absolutely they get they get conditioned but you know this more than any other bait um with the frequency that it puts out is just something that they can't resist um one other point in the construction um we only use salt water flash it's called salt water flash it's a much thicker flash the count on the baits ends up being much lower um than if you use uh one thirty second inch traditional flash the look in the water is also different than you get uh, much different. Um, the flow of the flash when you watch it is much different. And um, little differences uh, make, a, uh, make a big difference in the water, um, especially as your muskies get used to um, seeing these baits going through the season. Um, we'll talk about fishing in August versus fishing at the start of the season in a little bit. So um, thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, I gotta say, in this presentation tonight, um, I am very far from a technical wizard, and I'm great to have some help in putting this together. We can't show you any pictures or any video tonight, and muskies are uh, a, a very visual fish. And we do have good pictures and video, and in the future going forward, um, we will be able to uh, show you those and to, to talk off of those. Um, so something, something that will help us get better going forward. Um, I'm reading my notes. Normally I do presentations off of PowerPoint. I'm really comfortable looking at slides, but I've gone back 20 years and I have paper in front of me and this, uh, this seems a little tougher to organize. So I forgot to give Mike an, a proper introduction earlier. And I just wanted to, to say, you know, I've known Mike for almost 30 years. Um, we've been fishing together for almost 30 years. We have crazy, good stories going back a long time. I caught my first fish on a bait that Mike made for me in the 90s. Um, I still have baits that Mike made for me circa 2000 that still catch fish. Um, I told you Mike introduced me to Muskies Canada over 25 years ago. Uh, owe you a big thank you for that. Um, the first Muskies Canada event I ever fished with Mike, uh, I, I went with Mike and I I stayed with Mike in a cabin and Mike brought 13 whoppers as his food source for the weekend of muskie fishing. And that was it. And I don't even know if there was a cooler involved in the preservation of those, but the logic was that you can eat these fast and keep casting because, and that's what it's all about. So that's a pretty serious addiction and, a, and an iron gut stomach. Um, I fished uh, on the professional muskie tournament trail. Um, down in Kentucky with Mike as well. We had a great adventure. Maybe we'll share that with you on uh, on another uh, on another episode later. Um, another thing you should know about Mike is that he only fishes for muskies with Motley Crew on in the boat, 24/7 Motley Crew when he's chasing muskies. And and at this point, I wanted to show you the pictures 
of the fish that Mike caught this year, um, all with Motley Crew raging in the background and from all different areas on the water. I think you had your best year ever this year, did you, Mike? No Was question. that a best year ever? No question. No, yeah. que no question. Just killed it. It was so good to see you caught giant fish on the Rito. You caught giant fish in downtown Ottawa, in Orleans, out in the West. You caught them way down, uh, way down in the lower Ottawa. So just <clears throat> fantastic to see, all with Motley Crue raging. And <clears throat> we'll talk about music and, and muskies um, on a later episode too, because if we want to keep this to 60 minutes, um, I think we're doing good. We're, we're, we're uh, yeah, okay, we'll be a little bit over 60, but 60 to 90 minutes anyway. That's what they tell you you're supposed John, to do for these presentations. There's a couple of good questions in here. Um, just as I scroll through, it's a good time to, um, uh, just a good time to uh, have a look at them. Um, I have one here uh, from Rob Dykin. Um, it says, how many attempts did it take before you fabricated something worthy of selling under your business name? And that's a tough, that's a really tough question. I know that uh, learning to tie skirts, um, I went through an awful lot of skirts. Um, we were buying, we were having to buy packages of Flasher Boo. There's one right there in front of me. We were buying it like that and I was having to practice tying um, and they were expensive to learn. Um, and I would guess, I, I would guess that it was um, 30 baits probably before um, there was a finished product um, that we put our name on. Um, the 30 are around because they still work in catch fish. They just didn't have that professional quality. Um, I don't know if you had any uh, thoughts on that one, Johnny. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I've I've repped for a bunch of different. Um, I, I wish I could show you my room if I was comfortable picking up my uh, <laughs> my computer and turning it around. Um, I'd show you that I've got 400 different blade baits on the wall around me here from probably 50 different manufacturers. And I pro staffed in the old days for you know for Spanky Baits and some other companies um, and and got to use. A a whole I mean we've just used a whole lot of different baits over the years um, and then you learn what works best um, in terms of blade combinations in terms of colors in terms of producing vibration and so you know we kind of kind of knew where we wanted to go and then it was uh, learning to construct it construct it um, Mike talked about his painting process um, I don't know if you caught that striped bait it's got it's baked in an oven it's got electricity run through it and it gets five coats of paint so you know and and man and that is just as tough a blade as you can get on the hex blade which is which is hex so that it's going through the water um differently and in a more easy way it's easier for you to fish so just um researched um on a, on a different level and and i gotta tell you one of, one of the fun things i do with mike is we rent the pool every now and then and we go over to the local pool in orleans and throw baits around in the pool and see what our baits do in the winter time in the summer it's easy mike lives not far from the rito and just goes and chucks them off the shore i live on the water um you know it, it's easy to test um, but it's definitely been a progression and 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 we continue to evolve so um That'll hopefully always be. Got another question, Mike, that you liked? Yeah, I, I like this one because uh, it, it's something that, uh, that I do quite a bit. Ron Kane has asked, what do you think about adding a rubber grub or tail to the end hook? And I've got even, my grubs are in here. Uh, it's a great question. And um, it's something like that, because the blade baits are so diverse, right? You can use a... You can use them almost any time of year. Um, and what I find is, yeah, John's got one there. I've got, uh, I don't have any that are finished like that. Um, but I'll even use like this pack here. This is, these are just walleye baits, like little Mr. Twister. Um, and especially in the fall, when we're forced to slow down, I like to put those on. Um, it's great if they're scented. 
Um, and what, cause what I found is that uh, as water temperatures drop, those fish, because they're slow, they tend to take more and more of a look at that lure before they take it. And often, especially in cold water, if you get a fish figure eighting, it'll be almost kissing that flat. The flat will be touching its, its mouth. Um, and I've heard Lund uh, Lawrence Gunther says they're tasting with the outside of their mouth if they touch a bait. Um, and so I like, I like one of those little Mr. Twisters, um, and you can either just hook it on the back hook or you can be a little more creative by uh, cutting it open and uh, using a lighter to uh, weld it back together around the shaft of the treble hook. Um, but just giving that little bit of action, that little bit of uh, natural look and taste when they really need to take time, especially in colder water, um, that, that's, that's been one of my secrets for a while with our baits. Modifica you're holding up a bunch of your modifications to your baits are a really great idea especially as you get later in the summer because all your fish have been in the same place and they've seen all the baits go by and they know what they all sound like uh, they know what they look like and so you need to be different at that point i fish with uh, a lot of different guy americans who fish the professional musky tournament trail I've seen a lot of their tackle boxes, and it amazes me that um, they have, they're happy to take their inlines and just stab twister tails on, on different hooks on them sometimes in different places just because it adds something different because it, it, it makes it run a little different. It's not the one that the, the fish has seen, you know, a couple thousand times already. So rubber on a bait. Um, um, Man, back in the 70s, uh, I was taught to put Uncle Josh's pork rind red onto my, uh, onto my black bucktails. So mods are a great thing, you know. Be different. Be different. Fish see a lot of inlines. Be different. That's great advice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jason, your right. show says, hey, guys, what, what color combo is your most productive in the Ottawa River? That's a tough question. It's better for um, you than me. Yeah, well, I have a segment coming up, Jason, on uh, on choosing the right color at the right time. So, um, hmm. black and gold in general has absolutely um, killed it the last couple of years. We have a golden, this is our golden night color. Um, in our inlines, um, that's been absolutely, absolutely spectacular. This is uh, this is a burner. I don't throw burners very often, but um, this is great for kids, great for uh, tired people, great for when fish are inactive, great in the spring. Um, it's got sevens so it's easy it's called a burner you can fish it at uh lightning lightning speed but the color is canadian iron man and um that bait has absolutely crushed it on the river uh the past couple of years um this color right here black pepper and salt um and another absolutely magical for us it was uh, it, it was um it's been one of my top five producers like every year for the last decade um and it started out as a bright sunshine color for me i'm gonna jump ahead i guess and, and go a little more on colors because the question's there but um how do you choose what color to use um we'll answer two questions and one uh, another one that's there um what is a what does a bait look like an inline or a spinner bait, you know, what does that look like to musky? I get that out in the boat all the time. So that looks pretty stupid to a person. Why, why would a fish eat that? And in order to understand that and to choose your color, you need to go to the musky POV, the musky point of view. And that is like this, looking up. Muskies have their eyes on the top of their head. And they hunt in front or upwards mostly upwards um and so you need to appeal you need to appeal to that blades blades are meant to run just under the surface and so a fish sees that blade spinning just under the surface 
creating a commotion on the water, and then it sees uh, a profile. Hopefully, it only sees a profile in behind. Um, the spinnerbait blades actually break the water even. And if you think of a fish that, if you've ever seen a fish running away uh, from another fish on the water, um, they get to the surface, they race, and they jump out of the water on and off and on and off. And so a spinnerbait actually looks like that under the water. And then in choosing your color, um, what the fish sees is that bait and then a background behind that bait. And that background is dark or cloudy or it's blue or it's really bright because the sun is even in their eyes. Okay, but that background allows the fish to profile that lure. And so if you have a bait color that's easy, that contrasts the background, um, like you have a black bait on a, on a light sky, the fish sees that very easily. Same thing if you have a really bright bait on a dark sky background, a fish sees that really easily. So the general rule for choosing colors is on a bright day, choose a bright color. And so we like the, you know, we like the disco ball. Man, I'm old enough to say that. We like the disco ball colors, you know. When you have a bright sunshine and this is in the water, this, the, this thing is just reflecting light like a disco ball, like a mirror ball. And if you're a fish underneath and you look at that, you no longer get a profile. What you get is a whole lot of different flash and color that's all moving. And so you can't, you just know it's going fast. It's near the surface. It's, it's creating a vibrate, big vibration, but you don't get the good look at it. And that means you've chosen um, a good color. And so um, same thing with that black bait on the dark, on the dark day, you just want the profile of something dark, something that looks alive, moving like it's alive, giving a vibration like it's alive but something that you can't get a complete view of. And so that's the thought that generally goes into picking colors. And then you can always go back to the standard rule for musky fishing if you can't figure it out. And that is you can use any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> and so the black skirted inline is, uh, you know, if you're putting together a wardrobe, um, if, if, if you're a, a woman, you need the the little black skirt is one of the basics that you buy, as I understand um, <laughs> from my years. Um, and so if you have a black bucktail with silver blades, a black bucktail with orange blades, and a black bucktail with chartreuse, that's, that's three of the very first baits that you should buy. And then you should start and add a few of the bright sunshine days, and that'll round out your, uh, round out your collection. So... Thanks for helping me jump ahead on that, Jason. Um, there's one more. We have about five minutes left. Somebody's asked a question, and I know you and I, we did to talk about it, and we skipped over it. Um, where did it go? It was about staggered blades. Um, someone was at Brian Sturch. How do you like the staggered blades? I think that's a really good one, because you and I talk about that quite a bit, and, and we do sell them as customs. Yeah, um, staggered blade. Well, Brian likes those staggered blades a lot because I think he caught a, a, a really nice muskie and, and should have had a second really nice muskie if there wasn't a guide error. A very, very rare guide error. I won't recall it, but um, on a night out on the Ottawa River earlier earlier this year. So those staggered blades, um, we, we went through it. Lorinda, if you saw the story of Lorinda's fish, um, there was a month where those blades just crushed it. And if you talk about modifications for baits again, um, um, staggered blades again, puts out a vibration that's different than, than the two mag eights, uh, or the two tens together or the two twelves. It's a completely different vibration, a different frequency for the fish. So, you know, especially in the dark low light, I think that makes a, a big difference. And and for your experienced fish later in the year, Mike, I'm just gonna clarify something you said a moment ago, because we're not gonna cut it off at one hour. We are gonna go a little bit longer than that. Um, the Facebook okay. tutorial said 60 to 90 minutes. 
but we're going to try in general to shoot for closer to the 60 minute. Got a few more things to say um, to say this evening, and there seems to still be a bit of interest. Yeah. So uh, we'll go we'll go for a little while on that. Um, on the on uh, on spinner baits, just wanted to talk about spinner baits and my background and Mike's background with spinner baits and how we got to a hybrid. Um, spinner baits. We like to think that we originated high speed trolling for muskies with spinner baits in the muskie world. If you go back 30 years, Rob Day is a guy from Muskies Canada. Um, Rob's the first bait maker I got to know uh, well and use his baits. And yeah, we all owe homage to, to Rob. I have, I have, uh, I don't know, I think 80 or 90 Rob Days still around and most of them i mean this is a this is an old rob a really old rob day here and there's a couple things about this um i, I wanted to say um there's been a lot of the bucktail taken off of this and so you know it used to be a bigger bait but they've never been a big bait and yet this this bait probably caught more muskies than any other bait on the ottawa river maybe in a lot of the kawartha lakes for uh for a decade and it's still I have a box of them that I pulled out of my boat at the end of the season. Um, just, uh, just a wonderful bait and and something that's been around for 30 years and from Ottawa. And so Rob Day, a, a ba Rob Day is a bait maker that we both looked up to for a long time. I want you to look at the head of this bait right here. Um, it tells you how muskies hit baits, and this is the right bait to fish um, from June until October. It does, in, blade baits are the right bait to fish from June to October. They do much less well at the end of the season um, um, as, the, as, the water, as, the, as the water gets colder. Um, and I lost where I was going with that. <laughs> so let me just refresh on my notes for a second. Um, How muskies hit yeah, a couple the of How? Oh, yeah, okay. So there's no, thank you, Mike. <laughs> There's no paint on the head of this bait. And that's because muskies nine out of 10 times hit baits in the head, okay? Your inline, your spinner bait, nine out of 10 times. So your business hook on these baits is right here. It's it's your front hook. And so good spinner bait, if somebody's uh, showing you a spinner bait, should look like that, um, hits in the head. So Rob Day was uh, the, first, uh, the first guy in in this. Um, not long after in the 90s, uh, Eddie Lalone, Muskies Canada guy, uh, my childhood fishing partner, came up with river rat spinner baits. And if you think pink isn't a good color in the musky world, look at the head of this bait. That's all that you need to know from this. Um, river rats is a bait that's uh, still around today, still catches fish all over North America. Um, Eddie, rest in peace, passed away in his lady, lazy boy. Um, tying baits for a guy in New Jersey. And so uh, Eddie Lalone, somebody who taught me about hair baits um, from the time I was 13 years old on and uh, what he does and what Sam Hill has carried on in the modern day with the river rat spinner baits. Um, a lot of you might think that looks pretty silly, but um, if you're somebody in the know in the musky world, you know that a bait like this um, is responsible for producing an awful lot of giant fish in Georgian Bay on the St. Lawrence and in a whole lot of places south of the border too. So um, kudos that these Ottawa guys um, have their baits all over North America and stories of fish caught on their baits um, all over and they inspired Mike and I. And I'll give kudos to one other, um, Jimmy Willison. Jimmy Willison is a guy you probably don't know up here but his baits were for sale obscurely in Orleans from the early 90s on. Jimmy is from Willie's Bucktails in the States, and I used to look at these. Some American guy made them, and they were for sale in Orleans, and they were out of doll hair, and I thought, wow, that was dumb because, you know, we had real bucktail here. And not just bucktail. One of the reasons the Ottawa bucktail is so sought after is uh, bucktail is deer tail, as I said. We live in a snow belt in the Ottawa Valley we get um, a lot of snow 
we get an awful lot of snow in the winter. I think our record's 18 or 19 feet um, total over the winter. So our deer grow more hair to stay warmer and the bucktail on our bucks is about that much longer than everybody else's bucktail. And that's why our bucktail guys around here are so good. But back to Jimmy and his bait. Um, Jimmy taught me about construction and making baits and he's somebody I hung out with at a lot of the American shows in uh, in Pennsylvania and Ohio um, a bunch of years ago and we just had great conversation on construction and Jimmy used to come up here in the 90s and he between two boats they would encounter a hundred fish on their first trips in a week on the river just fishing these and so um, and short line trolling these a lot of the time. So, you know, somebody else who uh, doesn't get kudos locally, but, um, you know, uh, 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 Greg and Mike and all the Ohio boys have been coming up for uh, a, a lot of years catching a lot of fish on these. And so those are the people that took us to, uh, to making a hybrid today. And thanks. Credit where credit is due. Um, comments on spinner baits. When to use? How do you know when to use an inline or a spinner bait? Um, I love spinner baits at the start of the year because um, you can fish. I fish a lot of one and two feet on opening day in the first week of the season, and you can throw your inline spin your spinner baits, traditional spinner baits, into the weeds and over the stumps and up on the shore and not get caught. And so. Muskies are looking for warm water. They're looking for emerging weeds. They're in really shallow. Spinner baits are an absolute great, that's a great time to use a spinner bait. The other great time to use a spinner bait is in thick weeds. Um, we talk, might talk about our, our Indiana blades riding up high on the surface and most of our baits are designed to fish up higher in the, uh, up at the top of the column. But when you wanna get down in the weeds, we fish on top of the weeds or on the edge of the weeds, but when you want to get down in the weeds, now you have to be more weedless. And so you sacrifice hooking percentage for being weedless. And so now the single hooks are a real advantage. And so you can let a bait and hit the surface and sink down three feet in your six feet of water and be pulling it through the middle of the weed bed, be pulling it just over the top of muskies that are in the weeds. Um, and that's when these baits really shine or uh, slow rolling them on the bottom in the heavy weeds is a really great thing to do. Um, that's an American tactic from the Midwest from years ago. All of those have their advantages. Um, a limiting advantage for a spinner bait is hooking percentage because of the single hookups, and then you lose fish during the fight, again, because of the single hooks. Um, one modification you can do, I like to take my spinner baits and put a, a pair of pliers on them, and twist the front hook to the left, to the right, and the back hook to the left a little bit. So my hooks now run offset, and you have a little more hook point exposure, and that'll help you um, hook up a little bit more. But that's a couple of times when you can really use a spinner bait. When should you use inlines? Um, the most productive bait at all. Um, we always almost always for the first five months of the season have somebody in the boat throwing an inline because fish will always um, will always eat an inline um, when things start to change is in august um, and you have to fish august differently as a musky fisherman and you have to adjust your blade bait presentations um, in august and so your fish um, muskies are on their home range from early June until early September. They're in the same place. They've settled down and research shows that they use the same home range every year. So they get used to you fishing your spot year after year after year. They see your bait week after week from the start of the muskie season or from early June all the way through August, week after week after week. You caught them on your bait early in the season and that reinforced to them that your bait is bad news. And so you've got to be sh throwing something different. And so last year we came out with the Sonics and the Sonics was a game changer. Um, as Mike pointed out earlier, because of the sound chamber, um, I make a living at sunset on the Ottawa river. Um, 
and that sound chamber, I fish this a lot more in the dark and I, because it's easier for the fish to find. It's a sound they haven't heard, and especially for my experienced fish later in the year. And then I had a whole bunch of pictures to show you of, um, of fish we caught this year in August on the hybrids. And this is the first year we were throwing the hybrids. I'm fishing spots and I'm spotting muskies with my, uh, with my side imaging on these spots. They're not moving for traditional baits. They've seen my baits. Uh, they, they've seen most of my presentations. A and then we're breaking out the hybrids. And just like in the early days of the cowgirls, those fish are eating hybrids at the side of the boat because they've never heard anything. They've never felt anything with that combination of skirts, weights, and blades. There's not been never been anything like that in the water so being different um in august um more than any other time is really important so in terms of when and where to use what um there's some basic guidelines for you any questions that you're seeing there mike i i think we're pretty caught up lisa's Lisa been answering questions in the in the chat there I, um so i think we're pretty it. caught up at this point i Don. see it's been flowing along really well. I did want to do a section on fishing easier. Um, and that's really important. Like I said, as a guide, I watch, you know, I, I try to preserve people's energy for hour nine, for hour eight and hour nine of the day, because that's, that's the most likely time that, that they're going to get a strike. And so um, if they're chucking in lines all day, that is a tiring exercise. There's a bunch of things that you can do uh, to make it easier for you to throw in lines all day. Um, the first thing that you can do is to have the right equipment and to let the equipment do the work. So go back 20 years ago when cowgirls were created, we created, uh, Muskie Mayhem created a bait that had more drag. That vibration that comes off of the bait is because that bait has more drag in the water than anything that we've ever thrown before. And so we broke the heck out of all the musky reels 20 years ago. And every reel manufacturer that made reels for musky guys had to up their game simply because of inlines. And year after year, you know, and not only that, then we started going to bigger and bigger blades and, and you know, it just got stupid. More skirts, more everything. And the resistance got, uh, got more and more. So to make it easier, use the right equipment. Um, I asked J.P. DeRose at the Toronto Sportsman Show last year before one of my presentations. I said, J.P., I want to go on stage. This is a this is the Tranks 300 PG, not the high-speed reel. The PG handle on this myself. It doesn't come with the power handle. But I said, this combination right here, this is the most power for the least size and weight in the world for a bait caster yes or no he said yes on all the specs yes this is it so the trank set came out a few years ago through um through shimano has changed the game for so many people it makes throwing in lines easier it enables you to get more speed out of your in lines than uh, any reel that's that i've ever used that i've ever seen um, it's been a game changer. And so having a right reel, having a power handle on your reel and letting the reel do the work is going to leave you with a lot more energy late in the day when it's important. Um, secondly, with your equipment, you've got a long rod. Um, ideally, you've got a nine and a half foot Skix because physics says with a longer rod, you can cast farther with less energy. So let your rod and your reel do the work and then let your body be relaxed while you're fishing. This reel sits right here when I fish, when I retrieve. And that's because my rod sits under my arm and my reel sits right here. And I don't have to grip and squeeze my reel so my hand gets tired. I can leave my reel loose in my hand. I can keep my back straight. I can have a look around and I can be relaxed and let the equipment do the work. And so that's probably the best advice I can give you. Um, I watch 
you know the old days people with the with with the abu 6500s that we had and stuff man that was a lot of work and i, I couldn't sure i couldn't do it at this age um so let the technology help you um second thing um being different is good at any time the hex pattern for blades if you choose baits with a hex pattern um those come through the water the cert they break the water um they break the water differently and more easily with the rough surface. They create less friction. They go through the water easier, and that's the physics. And the second thing I'm going to tell you is you don't have to throw tens. Okay? Um, the musky world started with tens and then went to twelves and made them bigger. And then something happened where people started putting eights on blades. And the boards in the states showed that people were catching just as many fish on the mag eight blades as they were on the tens. And so if you're a caster, if I'm trolling, I'm trolling the tens most of the time because I want more vibration. But if I'm casting for ease, I'm throwing mag eights, okay? And we have, uh, I showed you the burners. I mean, that's as small and light as you can go. We have the eights as well with a set of mag eight blades and a single skirt on the back. This is uh, this is a double double, two skirts on the back with mag eight blades. All the size, the vortex is still big in the back, but again, a whole lot of difference in the drag that this lure makes um, coming through the water. And that's important, you know. Energy conservation as you age in life is uh, is a big deal, you know. I still want to fish nine and ten hours, so there's some things that can uh, can help you. Um, oh. And one other thing I'll point out. Um, this is a set of 12s. Now, we sell 12s, and there's a right time and a place for 12s, and if you are Superman, you can throw 12s. I throw them where I know there's big fish. I throw them when I've had fish up that didn't need other baits, and I need to see them something different, different but it is a hard, hard bait to throw for very long. Um, a lot of bait makers sell 12s, but you only sell a few to people because they put them on, they throw them for a few minutes, they look great on paper, but holy mackerel, a lot of work. So, you know, 12s, great for trolling applications, great for spot casting in right places, um, really tough and just impossible without the right equipment. If you find baits that have a reticulation in them like this, stay away from that. You're going to spend five to 10% of your casts unhooking this off of your leader uh, until you get frustrated and you go back to another bait. And so when Mike was talking about um, um, shrink tube on the bottom, keeping your hook perfectly straight, keeping it in position for the hook set away from the flash of um, the same with your, your hook up here, um, keeping it out of your flash, keeping your bait straight, all of those things lead to better performance of your bait, okay? Lead to it going through the water more easily as well. And so, you know, making sure that that, that is, stays flash free, that your bait's straight, all of critical importance. Uh, I think we're... What time are we on? 8.15. Wow. As usual, I have m more slides and more talk than uh, than time, but um, we've got a few more minutes. Is there a question or two that we can pick off of there? Um, and I'll try and pick a, a couple of best points. Yeah, there's a, a couple of questions in here. Um, there's, uh, and uh, some of them are related to reels and some of them are related to baits. Um, but I think because you were just chatting, oh, and then there's another one that would be a really good one. Okay. Um, the one I thought would be a good one, and I know Lisa put a bit of a comment in on this one, is somebody was asking about using scent, yeah. um, how to clean uh, and off of baits and adding scent. I know scent is a hot topic because it was in uh, this our recent issue of Muskies Canada Relief Um And okay. it's a great time to you know, keep off of skirts, right? Okay. 
Um, scent is a scent is a great question. Um, this is an old generation bait that I used, and I watched a guest put scent on it because I didn't know any better. This is back 15 years ago with the first generation cowgirl, and so he put scent on my flash, and immediately it changed everything about the flash because now it doesn't flow. It catches and it starts to goo. And so you really need to keep scent away from your skirt on your bait. Scent is a great idea. Um, scent is a great idea for masking. Even though we're fishing fast here, scent is great for masking scents. If you're going to put it on a bait, put a little bit up on the top of your bait. Put a little bit on your line, okay, in front of your lure. Keep it away from this. Okay, and keep the bad scents off your hands, you know, no hand sanitizer on your palms, no uh, sunscreen on your palms, don't get any of that on your bait, you know, keep that stuff, keep the bad scents on the back of your, on the back of your bait. Um, scent is a good idea on inlines, um, it is really tough and you wreck a lot of your inlines by doing it. I saw a question about the 300 or the 400. Um, the 400 and the 300 actually tranks actually have the same specs. There's only one difference in them, and that's um, the 400 tranks has 22 pounds of drag. This reel right here, the 300, has 18. That's not a lot of difference. I can still crank the drag right down, lock it down, and keep it locked for my hook set. Um, for me, the game as I age is all about easy easy fishing in lines, letting my equipment do the work, lighter equipment, lighter reels. And so I, I go to the 300 a, a lot of the time um, and I use the low speed um, with a power handle. The difference between the, the uh, HG and the PG, this you can turn all day with no resistance. The high speed reel does have a little bit of resistance and you don't need to burn it. Watch the bait in the water. It's coming in way faster than you think it is because of the gearing in it. So, yeah, the 300 is my reel in the in the modern day. Okay. Uh, here's a good one, and it was something that we did meant to touch on. Uh, Danny was asking, uh, can you talk about how to straighten your lure when it's been bent by your last catch? Sure. Um, if you get a bait that's, the wire that you buy from us that the wire is too badly wrecked on, send it back to us and we'll rewire it and send it back to you. Um, I'm gonna bend this one here the way that a muskie would, hitting it in the head and it's usually bent somewhere right in here. And your bait often looks just like that at the end of, of a fish. And you know, that's not a problem. This this. This is a really good problem because you just caught a muskie, a ferocious fish with giant teeth, and um, that's what they do to our bait. So when you have a bait with a bend, you want to go to the point of the bend and apply pressure with your thumb on the bend and then straighten the back half of the lure. And then I'm going to turn it around and put my thumb on the bend again right where the bend occurred. Make sure that I'm looped like this, and I'm going to twist it back up like that. And so we've gone from we've gone from a U to a pretty functional bait, a straight bait right again. And um, you know, brand new baits, they run perfectly symmetrically. After your bait gets a little bit bent, just watch it in the water and make sure that make sure that it's not twisting. If it's twisting, if you see the body of the bait twisting, it means that the you don't have the wire quite straight going through some of the coils in the middle or it's catching on some, some of the, uh, the beads or the metal in the middle here. So just have a go at it again there. Um, one other thing I'm going to show you, um, these blades here, we use the thinner blades and a lot of the thin blades, we use them because they put out higher vibration. But, you know, as you get into a hundred or hundreds of hours of, of uh, time in the water and high speed time, you start to warp your blades and they lose putting off a heavy frequency. 
and you can fix this really easily by taking a pair of pliers and just flattening that out four times on each of the blades and you'll notice night and day when you make that next cast at, at how much resistance is back into that bait and how much vibration is off of the bait. So, you know, if you've got a bait that's tired, but it's still got some fish in it, flatten your blades out and get some more hours out of it. Um, one other fix it tip, because we didn't go very deeply into that section. Um, I keep a lot of electrical tape in my boat. Um, we have a repair kit, as Mike said, and there's nothing that uh, nothing that's better than shrink tube on the back and then having a hook with epoxy so that your flash isn't going to get caught in it. Um, but if you don't have shrink tube, um, electrical tape, black electrical tape, I keep red electrical tape and I have some white electrical tape. And sometimes I get crazy and I add a little bit of different color into the back of my bait. Adding a little bit of red into a black bait has always been great. So um, let's see. If only I was more organized, I could show you that now, but next time. So there's a couple more tips for, uh, for repair. I, I can share one as well. Um, when the baits start to spin in the water, um, you can also put a bend in this uh, top wire. I've got an old golden knight of mine. It, not only does it have warped blades, but it's got a bent wire. I haven't had a chance to rewire it. Um, but if you take a pair of pliers, I'm going to hold this up really close, and I give this a soft bend, what happens is uh, the bait is going to get stuck in that position in the wire, uh, in the water. Um, it's not going to roll anymore. So uh, the fish aren't going to see anything different. There may be a slight difference in the engagement of the blades after casting, um, but you can certainly extend the, the lifetime of that bait. And then once again, when it's one of our baits, bring it back. I'll put a wire in it for you. Um, I love being able to do that for people and see our baits have another life because um, they all deserve to be in the water, stay in the water. Um. I want to give one other tip on, on used baits here. And if you look at this color here, this is our, our black pepper and salt. And this particular bait here um, looks like a good musky bait should. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's a 20 to 25 fish bait in its day. And there is uh, probably 35% of the flash that's left on this bait from what we started out with. And so a lot of people would discard that at this point. But um, I I'll tell you, baits like this get like this because the musky teeth cut the flash. So having broken flash um, is just a natural part of your bait being successful. And losing this much flash is a sign that this bait has been successful over and over and over again. So when I have baits like this, um, whether it's a wooden bait or an inline, and especially with these, I keep throwing this bait. Um, and a lot of times, you know, one of the neat things about flash is the full flash lure behind the vortex creates an image that's this big in behind the bait. Well, that this doesn't do that anymore. But at the same time, I can tell you it appeals to fish at a really, really high rate. So um, when I get a bait that's really worn down like that, I don't discard it. As long as it's catching fish, I just keep fishing it until until there's <laughs> until there's nothing left to fish with. So um, use them until you can't use them anymore. Just because it doesn't look like it's a, a brand new, off-the-shelf appealing bait, it got that way for a reason, and uh, keep using it. What about um, in heavy, rough waters, do you bend it? Um, I have a neat one here that you made a couple years ago for, for Lawrence, Mike, um, just in terms of oddity baits. I was going to show that too. Mike actually made this for, uh, for Lawrence Gunther, who will be on the show a little later on. Um, Lawrence's bluefish, but this has single hooks. And Mike made this for Lawrence for fishing for 
easy release. Um, Lawrence is a blind fisherman and he handles his own fish. Um, he's an amazing man uh, uh, and an amazing fisherman. And uh, this was experimental for him. But um, And for fishing out of a kayak, I believe, was the original design for this as well. Again, for kayak guys to be able to, you know, you can't afford to spend that much time um, with the fish right beside you. You need something that you can release a, a lot easier. Jamie Pastilli will tell you a story about getting hooked at the side of a kayak when he's on our show a little bit later on. So, um, I think we're coming pretty, pretty darn close to our 90 minute limit and uh, I want to be a man of my word. So, uh, thanks to everybody who watched this evening. Thanks Mike for, uh, for your friendship, your partnership in Muskie Factory Baits, for figuring out the technology today, along with Lisa, who's behind the scenes. Thanks, Lisa, for answering all the questions that you did. Um, your questions will drive this, so uh, send them. Um, if you see something, you watch something later, because we're going to leave these up on the Muskie Factory Bait site as a resource. Um, we'll answer your questions whenever they come in. Um, so. We want to, your topics, your suggestions, your questions, that'll help us design our, uh, our future shows. We're definitely going to get better on the technology side of things. Um, and I'll just remind you again that we have, a, we have a contest for a hybrid. If you're tuning in late, you weren't here at the start. Um, if, if you like Musky Factory Baits or you go and like this video when it's posted live on our site after this um we're gonna draw two weeks from today for a hybrid to uh some lucky listener out there um so thanks very much for uh for your time thanks for just thanks just leave it at that um it was super informative it was great it's, it's great to go drum up old stories it's great to go through our baits and, and be reminded of um, all the TLC that goes into each one and all the development that uh, that went to to bring us to where we are now. Yeah, and a pleasure to be able to participate in the research. Um, and yeah, one of the other things that Mike and I really love is all the pictures that we receive with. Uh, people catching their first fish with their kids with fish with success where they haven't had it before. Um, it's just a whole uh, different level of satisfaction. So um, thanks. And we'll see you next week when we have Brent Bochak here to do Muskie 101. Um, Brent's the host of Setting the Hook TV. We're going to do uh, Muskie 101 from the beginning what you need to get started, all the basics of using the equipment, um, the basics of bait use, fish handling, and all from there. And if you've seen Brent talk before, uh, he's a, a great guy, a fun guy, and a, a really entertaining guy, an educational guy. So see you next week um, on Monday night for the Monday Night Muskie Series. Not Tuesday night, Monday night from now on. All the best. All the best. I'm going to cut it there, Johnny. Ciao.